So now, now we, we talk, we talk kind of loosely about yoga goals as things like transformation or, or maybe to do some more contemporary kind of talk, like discovering your authentic self or discover, discovering the divine within, right? We, we have, we hear these phrases, but like, what does that really mean in the classical context at least? So if, if when we're looking at these traditions, really the, the goal we can, we can talk about it many ways, but there are goals like, what is the ultimate nature of, of oneself? What is the ultimate nature of the world? Like, what's the, what, what is reality in the first place? What is the divine or God, Ishra, to, to use a Sanskrit generic term? Because in English, word, the word God kind of throws us off in, into a different kind of interpretation. So what, what are these relationships between these different entities, if we can call them? But then, but then there's always this tie-in generally that by understanding the deepest realities, metaphysical realities, in that understanding comes some of uh, an unwavering wholeness or a, an untouchable happiness or, or a deep abiding peace, like shanti or equanimity, samatvam in the Bhagavad Gita is a constant theme, developing equanimity. So, so ultimately meditation in the whole world of yoga philosophy, at least in, yeah, we, we can always find some exception, but, but generally speaking, uh, the yogic traditions are seeking freedom from suffering, right? And it's not, what, I, what I've been finding in, in different groups, teaching different kind of communities is that people are often reinterpreting the freedom from suffering in a way that fits the modern wellness industry. And here's where I wanna just make this distinction. Uh, goals like, you know, to use the technical terms like moksha, or nirvana, kaivalya, these sorts of terms we found, find in the yoga traditions, these are not wellness goals. Wellness is maybe part of that or included within that, but it's something far deeper and it's tied to a particular metaphysical reality. Right? So, so, I get, so one question that maybe this sort of ties back to this, I put this appropriation phrase out there. So, but, but what happens when, what kind of yoga do we have when we strip this deepest goal out? Just, you can just, there's something to think about. We have something that's arguably quite different. And what, then the question is, what do we do? Do we gain something or, but from the traditional perspective, what do we lose in, if we strip out these, the ultimate goal of liberation itself, freedom from suffering, or, or deep abiding, untouchable happiness. A happiness which is not a mental state. So it's something different than a mental state. So we that this is another big discussion. You know, wh what do we even mean by this happiness? We use the word bliss, and it's not, that's not quite correct because we think of bliss as an emotional state. But if, if, uh, if moksha is something that doesn't come and go, then it must be something different than an emotional state, which always comes and goes, right? There's no such thing as an emotional state that stays constant, because then we'd be like robots, right? <clears throat> so, so coming back to meditation, now, so this, the worlds of meditation are somehow designed for this goal, and for integrating knowledge, for turning yoga into lived practice, for interiorizing these worldviews, and also, I would say, a, a kind of spontaneous expression of the wisdom that is yoga, right? So it's not something we're grasping at, but something that is interiorized in a way that is naturally expressing in our interactions, not only with the world, but the way we, we are with ourself. Right? Like, how do we befriend ourselves, for example? Um, <clears throat> so, 
So understanding from the inside out, maybe you, you can put it that way. So this speaks, speaks back to what I, was, what I was raising early on about the importance of phenomenological reflection, like introspection into our experience. But suffering, they generally is discussed as, as a foundational uh, part of human existence. And the really, the found, so, so we might suffer differently because we have different existential crises or you know, different contemporary issues we're dealing with or different constructions of, of how we think about ourselves in society. So, so there are differences, but, but I'd say there's a, <clears throat> a deeper universal of dukkha, the suffering, which generally in, you know, whether we're talking about Buddhist or Patanjali's yoga or Advaita Vedanta, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, the, the, the general consensus is that our suffering is arising because we have mistaken our identity. We don't understand ourselves properly. And so it's not about how, that does, that's a universal basically. So one way to think about this is that we we've taken ourselves to be the mind-body complex, mind-body sense organ complex. <clears throat> and that complex, which is, you know, our, when we say me, we're pointing to our, to our body and including our, our mind, then it comes with the limitation that our body is and our mind is, right? We're separate, we're isolated to, in a certain way, we're subject to death, subject to pain. And it's a bit of a longer discussion, but if I just sort of make a leap without all the explanation, just for the sake of time right now, what ends up happening, and this, is, this is really beautifully detailed in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, is, is that we, we start projecting happiness outside. Right? So we experience ourselves in a limited way. We're, we suffer, not to say everything is suffering, all the time, but there is this a certain constancy to some level of suffering or anxiety or fear or whatever. And, and so then we start projecting happiness on material objects, on community, on love, romance, material, whatever it is, right? And some might be really wonderful things and we could say they're sattvic and some things might be more on this sort of negative spectrum, or maybe we call it tamasic or rajasa to use these yogic terms, but somehow we're projecting happiness. And, and sometimes it's within dharma and sometimes it's conflicting with our ethical norms, right? With, it becomes a dharma, negative. But the problem is it never works. Either we get what we want and we get this period of happiness, a state, a happy state, which is transient, right? So now we're back at square one, or we don't get what we want. And now we have frustration or anger at worst, or even confusion or other, other things on the sort of the negative spectrum. So I think there are these sort of uni universals, these, these sort of universal models of yogic psychology that, that I think arguably cut across cultures and just represent the human condition. I think that's at least how these traditions would see it. And so then these yogic traditions are saying, there's a way out, right? This is, this is the, the claim that they're making. And then what is the way out is the question, right? That's gonna differ across traditions, which also makes the role of meditation differ across these traditions. But generally they're, they are claiming something that the, you have to recognize and understand or maybe experience. There's also, okay, that's also a distinction to think about. Are we trying to understand something or trying to have an experience of something? Um, but by which you come to some new knowledge or you remove ignorance to be more precise. And with that removal of ignorance comes a recognition of freedom. And in many of these traditions, that freedom is also innate, right? So maybe just a, just a, a pause on this one point, because I think it's really important. The, the way many of us construct spirituality or, or yoga philosophy today naturally is that I'm going to transform to this goal, right? Kind of like the, the, 
the caterpillar to butterfly type of idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do all these things. I'm gonna change myself. I'm gonna change my body. I'm gonna change my mind, my senses, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna heal myself and work through all this stuff. I'm, I'm going to then reach or gain liberation or enlightenment, however we talk about it. But in, not in all, but in many of these traditions, certainly in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, in the Yoga Sutras, um, we have this phrase in Sanskrit, siddhasya siddhi, which means gaining the gained or accomplishing what is already accomplished. And so we, uh, I'll give you a, a quick, quick little anecdote for this. The, the classical story, for example, is 10 children who are leaving their ashram and they're going to like nearby village for, you know, get some treats or something. And they all swim across this river and they gather on the other side and they count each other and there's only nine of them, right? One of them didn't make it across. And now they're all upset and they're sad and you know, they, they count each other multiple times to make sure. And there's only nine. And then, you know, let's say a, a wise woman walks by and she sees them grieving and, and they tell her what happened. We lost one of them. And, and she looks at them and she goes, I know where the 10th child is. And, the, you know, they perk up and they say, oh, you know, they don't quite believe her because they, there's only nine of them. But, you know, they, where, 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 did, where did she go? Where did she go? How do we find her? And she goes, okay. She takes... She takes one of them and she goes, okay, now count everyone. He goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then she points to him, to him you are the 10th, right? So the, more, the, the idea of the story is that people, they just forgot to count themselves, right? So did they gain the 10th? Well, in a way, right? Because they eliminated all their suffering about it. And now there's 10 of them, but they didn't actually gain anything. And so this idea of innateism, innate freedom, innate wholeness runs through many of these traditions. And so it's a really beautiful thing to really sit with that because that actually changes our whole spiritual pursuit from going from being um, you know, finite and limited and sad and trying to reach this goal in the future to recognizing or having some trust, at least some trust uh, that, oh, these traditions are saying I'm actually complete and whole in the nature of fullness itself right now. So it's more like, you know, this, this analogy of the sculptor who's, who's chipping away at the, at the marble to find the, you know, the, the person within right? rather than creating something fresh. So this is so one, it just shifts the whole ideology because when you have that trust, by step, when you're stepping into these traditions, there is a kind of refuge in that trust. And in uh, an idea, like a, a trajectory, instead of going out, of going in to discover where is that wholeness that's already with me. Mm -hmm.